Well, good morning. You can uh, take out your Bibles and turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. For our guests, my name is Steve Heitland. I'm one of the pastors here. I want to welcome you as well as we're looking to finish our sermon series on 2 Peter, uh, Truth in Times of Error. Before I begin, I did want to update you. Last week I had um, prom- uh, highlighted a couple books that would be great Christmas books, and of course uh, they sold out. Uh, and so we ordered some more um, Prayers of the Puritans. We were able to get those. The Advent devotional almost made it. Uh, they're sitting in East Pete, so probably tomorrow <laughs> they'll be here. Um, so they'll be here next Sunday, or if you want to pick one up during the week, uh, you can contact Abby. I'm sure she can take care of that for you. So. Uh, we'd love to get those resources into your hands. And, of course, there's tons of, tons of great books in the bookstore, so you can enjoy and partake of those. So Second Peter 3. What makes a Christian strong? When suffering or trial befall a person, why do some people endure while others seem to be undone? Why are some people so discerning and helpful and others seem to be in this state of paralyzing confusion? Well, there's a whole constellation of words that we tend to associate with Christian strength. Words like mature, stable, faithful, steadfast, loving, and wise. I think it's also interesting that we don't tend to associate those qualities with words like dynamic or charismatic or exciting. There's nothing wrong with those words or qualities. They just don't tend to be linked with stability and strength. You don't say, oh, she just received very hard news, but she's going to be okay because she's so dynamic. No, when when we look for strength and stability, we know they have to come from another place. These qualities imply a testedness. They're proven over time in the face of adversity. When we admire someone's maturity, we know that it's been formed through hardship, through obedience through hardship, through endurance in the face of hardship. There's a discipline involved. Their admirable character has come at a cost. Conversely, when we see someone floundering in the face of hardship, we know that there's a weakness being revealed. Maybe he wallows in a pit of self-pity and then justifies his indulgence and anger. Or, Or maybe she demands endless care from others in her sorrows and sufferings. But weakness is being revealed as they face the inevitable trials of life. One of the main ways that weak people demonstrate their weakness is in how they tend to think that others have it so much more easy than they do. They think they have it harder than everyone else. They they look at others, if they even bother to do that, and, and they're blissfully unaware of the sorrows and the sufferings that we all inevitably face in this lives. Weak people tend to think that strong people don't face much hardship. The difference between the strong and the weak is not that the strong have an easier life. In fact, many times it's just the opposite. Often, I would say most often, Those who are genuinely strongest have reached that place of stability through great hardship. David makes that link explicit in Psalm 34. And notice how he ties our experience of God's goodness to how we look to him or don't in times of trouble. So Psalm 34, 8, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Weak people tend to expect life to be easy, and then they're shocked and saddened by the difficulty of it. They look around and they compare themselves to others, and and then they either sinfully condemn them for their failures, or they are sinfully envious of them for their blessings. But those who are strong have sought and found refuge in the midst of great hardship. They're stable, not because of some quality that they've produced within themselves or some quality they've found, but because they have looked outside of themselves to the Lord and placed their hope in Him. They've seen Him to be refuge in time of hardship. They've tasted and seen 
that he is good. They know what it means to hope in God. Now, maybe this doesn't seem like a very nice way to start a sermon. Isn't it wrong to to stereotype and categorize people like this? Isn't it self-righteous? And of course it can be. But it's something that the Bible does over and over again. It's the Bible that gives us these categories of strong and weak. And we're going to see that again today. Peter's going to conclude this letter by contrasting the weak and the strong, or he uses here the stable and the unstable. And he's going to make explicit the key to genuine Christian strength and stability because those qualities are found in only one place. Fight for stability by knowing Christ. Fight for stability by knowing Christ. So we fight for stability both in what we pursue and in what we resist. We fight for stability in our own hearts and minds and against the hostile world. And in this passage, Peter provides us with two categories of growth that produce stability. And the first is to work as you wait. Okay, if you want to be stable, you need to work as you wait. So let's read 2 Peter 3, verses 14 to 16. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters, when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. At the end of last week's message, we saw that according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That is, Christians are called to live holy lives in this age as we wait for the holy age to come. And so here in verse 14, Peter is picking up and applying that truth again. He's saying, since you're waiting for these, since you're waiting for these, what? What are we supposed to do as we wait for the holy age to come, as we wait for the final judgment? And verse 14 tells us to be diligent to be found in him. To be found by is legal language. It's the language of the courtroom, of a a judicial ruling, of to be found guilty or found innocent. And so Peter is saying, work hard to be found by him, to be found righteous. Except he's not saying that you can make yourself innocent or even make up for the things that you've done wrong. He's saying, work hard to be found by him. Be diligent to place your trust in Christ. So when that day of judgment arrives, you are found by and in him. This call to diligence is language that he's been using all throughout this letter, going back to the, the very beginning. We saw it in 2 Peter 1 5 make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge. And verse 10 be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. And so here, when we're commanded to be diligent again, to be diligent to be found in him, that link with holiness is again in view. Be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. So do you see the connection? Holiness is never an isolated pursuit. It's never something that you just do, an effort that you just make. Your pursuit of holiness is intimately, it's inextricably linked to your view of God and to what you think accountability to God looks like. That's why Peter's been pushing back so strongly against false teachers in this letter. It's why he wrote those scathing words against them in chapter 2. These these false teachers aren't arguing some obscure point of religious trivia. They're blaspheming the nature of God himself. And they're jeopardizing the souls of anyone who listens to them. And these are timeless and perennial issues in the church. Every age, from the time of Jesus all the way up to the present, sees some who want to claim that they are in right standing before God, while simultaneously denying those aspects of his revealed will in his word that they find inconvenient or embarrassing or outdated. And then often, as they reject those things, they turn around and critique those who do submit to the authority of Scripture. And they they say, you're outdated, you're legalistic, you're unloving. 
They issue prophetic warnings that if the church doesn't come along with the times, we're going to be left to the side. We're going to be irrelevant. We'll be on the wrong side of history. So notice again the language that Peter uses here in verse 14. He says, be diligent. Be diligent to identify and fight the lies. Be diligent to put your sins to death. Be diligent to trust in Jesus. Now, we don't need to be called to diligence over something that comes easily and naturally to us, right? No one ever said to the two-year-old, now, be diligent to eat your birthday cake, right? That's a very natural task. Now, the, the call to diligence only makes sense in a context of hardship. There's some difficulty involved. There's some obstacle to be overcome. So Peter calls us to be diligent because we're not naturally inclined to be diligent whether because of our own sins or because of the deceit and manipulation and hostility of the world, those who hate God, it's easy for us to let off and to drift away from the Lord and from his truth. It is always easier in the short term to go with the flow. And the flow is always away from godliness. It can be wearisome to fight our sins. It can be wearisome to stand against what the world is demanding that we celebrate as good and beautiful, but that God calls wicked and ugly. Right now, homosexuality is one of those issues. Over the course of my lifetime, that has gone from something shameful to something to be accepted to something that must be celebrated. And this past week, the Senate passed a, a, an Orwellian-named bill, the Respect for Marriage Act. And, and as they work through the final negotiations with the House and they send it to the desk of President Biden, who's certainly going to sign it, we're facing a situation where God's word is being declared to be wrong, to be immoral. What God says about marriage, this institution that he lovingly designed for the good of humanity, is going to be officially declared bigoted. And out of date. Well, how will Christians respond to that? There is a great sorting going on right now on this issue and other issues like it. Some have already signaled their surrender. They praise this as an example of, of pluralism and religious liberty. And, and others are pulling out their hair and running around in little circles. But many are kind of in limbo. They want to be loving and tolerant. And sometimes, even more importantly, they want to be seen to be loving and tolerant. And they've been catechized by the world on what those terms mean. And so they're looking for a way to go along to get along. A way to avoid exposure and censure. It's like the politician who's supposedly personally opposed to abortion, but somehow always votes in favor of it. Their religion's so private it never even comes out of their mouths. But what would Peter say to us? He says, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish. In chapter 2, he called false teachers blots and blemishes. Isn't that interesting? Those who compromise on biblical truth, who distort doctrine, are blots and blemishes. He said they revel in deception. Their eyes are full of adultery. They're insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. Their hearts are greedy. They promise freedom but deliver slavery. All of that is in chapter 2. Peter's saying to the church, to his beloved you're going to need to fight for this. The fight is inevitable and inescapable. If you go along with the world, you are on the path to death and destruction. A necessary part of righteousness is to fight the enemy. Courage is required. It's not optional. Of course, he's not talking in fighting. He's not talking about guns and bombs. He's talking about a spiritual battle. He's talking about the war in our own hearts, in our own desires for autonomy and the approval of others. That's one of the big reasons he's been emphasizing the judgment to come and the eternal state. Our understanding of those doctrines profoundly influences and shapes our lives in the here and now. Doug Moo has memorably and simply summarized it this way. Eschatology leads to ethics. Eschatology leads to ethics. Where you think this is all going and what you think will happen when you get there is profoundly shaping how you live here and now. 
And if your answer to those eschatological questions is, I don't know and I don't care, don't think that's not shaping you. It is. It's just robbing you of clarity and hope. It's demotivating you to righteousness and holiness. And so in verse 15, where Peter tells us to count the patience of the Lord as salvation, he's appealing again to those doctrines. In in verse 9, he addressed the the scoffers, the false teachers who were saying, look, Jesus isn't going to return because where is he? I don't see him. Keep saying he's going to return. Nowhere to be seen, right? That's a fairy tale. It's a myth. And, And in addressing them, he's saying, look, the Lord is being patient. He's being merciful towards you. He's holding out his salvation to the repentant. And then here in verse 15, he's saying the same thing. The Lord's patience is salvation. If you're here, the almighty God is calling you to trust him and to live for him, to trust Jesus and receive pardon, to receive the gift of his righteousness, to be in right standing before him, to be at peace with God. The Lord is being patient that we might be saved. It's an incredible mercy and kindness. And then Peter turns to what might seem to be a tangent. He references the writings of Paul and he says, in essence, I'm saying the same things that Paul has written to you. This isn't novel. This is standard apostolic teaching. But, he says... Paul's not always simple to understand. That's one of those comforting verses, right? (laughs) You read Romans, you're like, this is not simple to understand. (laughs) Peter says, you're right. Paul's not always simple to understand. And some people twist and distort what he's saying for their own selfish purposes. So we could say it this way. You can find a Bible verse to support almost any foolish idea or immoral pursuit or heresy that you want. You can find them. And you can probably find someone in history and someone currently living who will support you in that interpretation or application. But notice how Peter classifies those people in verse 16. They are ignorant and unstable. In chapter 2, verse 14, he called them accursed children, which, of course, applies immaturity and foolishness. So part of what makes for weakness and instability is doctrinal and theological ineptitude. It's willful, of course, but it's also inept. But we have to think this through. These people, these false teachers, had biblical arguments. They were going to Scripture to justify their positions. They were going to Paul to say, this is why we don't believe that Jesus is going to return. And Peter doesn't say, well, I guess we'll just have to agree to disagree, right? You have your interpretation, I have mine. No, no, he calls them ignorant and unstable. He says they're twisting Paul's words like they always do with the Bible. In chapter 2, verse 12, he called them irrational animals who were blaspheming about matters about which they were ignorant. So Peter wasn't very nice, was he? But he was very godly. And he was actually loving these people. Because he was treating them with dignity. This isn't just name calling. He's not throwing names at them. He's labeling them accurately. He's treating them as responsible moral agents who will one day give account to God. And he's appealing to them to turn from their foolishness, to repent and know the Lord's forgiveness and salvation in his patient forbearance with their rebellion. One other note here on this section... This is an important text for our doctrine of Scripture because Peter is here affirming that Paul's writings are part of Scripture. The New Testament uses that word for Scripture 51 times, and every time except for two of them, it's referring to the Old Testament Scriptures, the established canon that the the early church would have had. But here and in 1 Timothy 5.18, parts of our New Testament are called Scripture. So here it's Paul's writing. Now, 1 Timothy 5, it's a saying of Jesus from the Gospels. So this is part of the self-authenticating nature of our Bibles. This is God's word because God says it's his word. That's why it's his word. Right? We can appeal to other sources to, uh, to give other arguments, but that's the ultimate argument. We, we receive this book as the word of God because the spirit of God testifies that it is so. And you can say, well, that's circular reasoning. It's not. It's an ultimate authority, right? 
You don't appeal above God to prove something. There's no greater authority than God. He's the ultimate grounds of appeal. And he has given us his word that we receive with gratitude and submit to. And so in this short letter, Peter has provided us with at least three important teachings on the nature of Scripture. The first is that it is inspired and that it was produced by the concurrent work of the Spirit and the human author. We saw that in chapter 1, verse 21. The second is that the Scriptures include what comprises our New Testament. That's what we're looking at here. And the third is that it's, it's possible for Scripture to be badly misinterpreted and misapplied by bad actors who selfishly distort it to suit their own agendas. So part of how we need to exercise diligence in how we handle God's word is by studying it faithfully and humbly, looking to and and relying upon the spirit to illumine its truths to our minds and hearts. We need to be diligent in our study, mining the depths of scripture, because the deeper we go in God's word, the deeper we go in our knowledge and experience of God himself. And there is no more stabilizing and maturing doctrine than a right doctrine of God. To understand God for who he is is to be grounded in truth and beauty and goodness. So one of the surest ways to grow in strength and stability is to give ourselves to the study of God's word. As we're waiting for Jesus' return waiting for the age to come, Peter is calling us to work at growing in righteousness. And the study of God's word is one of the primary means he has given us to know him and to grow. So there's an expectation in the Christian life that we will grow over time as we study the word of God, and that if we're not studying his word, we're failing, we're falling. The author of Hebrews puts it this way. About this we have much to say, And it's hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, notice that ought to. This is the way things should be. You should be teachers. But you're not. You need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. Since he is a child... But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So you see the the contrast there, right? The child is unskilled. They're undiscerning. The child doesn't see and respond rightly to the things that he should. For an adult to be childish in this way is wrong. It's sinful. The mature, on the other hand, is helpful to others. They've practiced constantly. Therefore, they distinguish good from evil. Isn't that an interesting connection? That's a key. Do you have biblical clarity on good and evil? Does your judgment of reality align with what God says is good and evil, right? To have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. It's one of the key things that God's word does for us. It helps us to look into the the reality of the world and the reality of our own hearts and the reality of those that we're uh, assigned to care for and lead and love and to distinguish good from evil. That is a necessary part of Christian growth and maturity. So we don't study God's word because we're trying to earn something from God. Only Jesus does that. And we don't study God's word because we're trying to impress others. That's, that's foolish, it's counterproductive, it's short-sighted. We study God's word because it contains the very words of life. We study God's word because it reveals to us our Savior. We meet Jesus there. We study God's word because it's here that we're, we're comforted and we're corrected. It's here that we find hope and peace. It's here that we're, we're reminded and refreshed in the reality of who God is and what he is doing in his world. And as we grow in and by God's word, we will find that we are more stable, that we're more mature, that we're stronger by his grace. So we fight for stability by knowing Christ, and we know Christ through his word. That brings us to the second category of growth that produces stability, which is to watch as you grow. So let's read verses 17 and 18. 
You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. So after having given that little excursus on Paul's writing, Peter is right back to the matter at hand. And again, he's addressing the beloved. He's calling us to intentional effort from a specific disposition. And so he begins with the negative side. He says, don't do this, right? What are we not to do? Well, we're not to be carried away by the error of lawless people, which produces a loss of stability. So look at the progression there. False teachers are lawless, right? They, they push against the law of God. They deny its instruction. They deny that it applies to our lives. They find creative ways to explain away what God's word says, the, the clear teaching of scripture. They want to get rid of that. And if you look at the churches and denominations that are affirming homosexuality now, for example, you can look back and see how they began by uh, discarding scripture and uh, ordaining women among other things, right? That was one step. They, they uh, in, embraced feminism so that they could in, uh, ordain women as pastors. And if you look behind that, if you go back a little farther in history before that, you'll see how they uh, denied the inerrancy and sufficiency and authority of Scripture. They're saying, look, the, the Scriptures are inspiring. They're just not inspired, right? They're, they're really good in a lot of ways, but there's a few kind of unfortunate things that are really just the product of their times. Those aren't things that we need to submit to. And so they reject the law of God. They're lawless. And to reject the law of God is to reject God himself. It's to deny the goodness of his design and to resist his authority over our lives. They wanted the feminists to approve of them, and so they surrendered their Christianity in order to gain that. Peter is showing us how lawlessness produces instability. Because as soon as we put ourselves above God and start to pick and choose what we will believe and obey from his word, we start to undermine the ground from under our own feet. We're not undermining God. He's not threatened. We're undermining ourselves. There is no stability in man's standards and man's judgment. They are the very definition of shifting sand. So look at how quickly the the woke mob eats its own. Right? The, the oh so daring and brave feminists of the 70s are now the TERFs who are holding back progress. Are you familiar with that term? TERF, trans exclusionary radical feminist. It's basically any, they tend to be older women who went all in on the feminist movement but reject transgenderism. And the transgender ad- advocates are saying, you guys are the problem. You're, you're in the way of progress here. Right? You're out of step. And, and so they, those who were on the leading edge are now being cast to the side. They're they're not progressive enough. The reason this is so is because in rejecting God's law, we don't get freedom. We never get freedom when we reject God's law. We get more law and more oppressive law. God's law restricts us to be sure, but it restricts us by keeping us from death and destruction. And and it restricts us in order to point us to life and flourishing. It's like when you take a little kid bowling and, and there's those those bumper covers, right? They keep them from going in the gutter so that they can actually get the good stuff. They can knock some pins down. God's law functions that way. It says, don't go out here because this is is death. This is the, the utter destruction of life and joy and hope and peace, right? Don't go out here because this is uh, deceptive. It it looks good for, for sure, but it leads to death. And it says, instead, Go this way because this is life itself. I designed you for this. You you flourish in this. You find your purpose and meaning and happiness in functioning according to the way God has designed you to be. Right? It's the kindness of his law. So the false teachers who reject God's law in the name of freedom are ironically leading themselves and their followers down a road to instability and to slavery and to death. And they pile up new and increasingly oppressive laws along the way, right? Because they try a law and it doesn't work. And so they got to double down and triple down and make things harder and stricter and worse. 
So, Peter says, knowing this beforehand, what should you do? What should we do? We know this is what happens. What should we do? He says, take care. (laughs) Isn't that simple? Take care. Be aware. Be engaged. Don't be naively foolish. Recognize that there are people both inside and outside of the church who would promise you life and freedom, but lead you to slavery and death. So be careful. Live wisely. Ask the Lord for wisdom and discernment. Study his word so you're not swept along by the passing currents of whatever is acceptable to the world. Trust Christ and repent of your known sins so you're not walking in guilt and condemnation. That guilt and condemnation of unconfessed sin is so often the gateway drug to heresy. I don't know if we understand that connection, but, but when we have unconfessed sin, even if you say, oh, I don't believe in God, well, you're still in the image of God. <laughs> right? If you have unconfessed sin, you feel guilty, you feel wrong, you feel shameful. We're like Adam and Eve in, in Genesis 3, hiding from God because we know that we're in trouble. And it's, it's at that time that inevitably a, a false teacher just kind of happens along and says, hey, I, I got the solution to your problems. Your problem's not that you're a sinner. That, that's the old outdated way of thinking just follow me and I'll show you what true freedom is I'll show you what grace really really is like I am super gracious and if you're not careful Peter's saying you will be carried away he says take care that you are not carried away that's one of the many reasons we need to confess our sins to the Lord and know his forgiveness and grace which is ample and abundant and always freely given so that we can stand before God in a righteousness that's not our own, fully pardoned. It's not like I haven't sinned. I've sinned more than any of you know. I have plenty of reasons to be ashamed. And yet before God, I am forgiven and righteous in Christ. And if I'm walking around with unconfessed sins, I'm guilty and I'm condemned. And I'm susceptible to heresy and error, right? Because I I still feel it. I want to get rid of this burden. And I'm not going to go to the way that God has provided, which is Jesus Christ. So I'm going to go to something else. I I might try to uh, distract myself. That never actually pays off. I might try and drown my sorrows in some sort of escapist drug and alcohol or whatever. But I need a way to get rid of my guilt. Will Jesus do that? If you don't go to Jesus, you will go elsewhere, and it will be a path to death. So Peter says, take care that you're not carried away. Now again, we don't don't need that kind of caution for something that's not a real threat. Take care makes obvious that this is a real threat. We have to be aware of it. We have to be engaged with it. We have to look out for it. So if you get caught up in the air of a false teacher or a false teaching... Uh, He says, you will lose your own stability, right? So there's, there's kind of two options there. At best, you're going to be a Christian who is unsettled and weakened. You're unstable because of this false teaching. You lose your stability in that qualified sense. And so you'll probably become bitter and disillusioned and cynical. Those things tend to flow from a loss of the assurance of the grace and mercy of God in Jesus Christ. And at worst, if you keep going down that path, you will lose your own soul, to use Jesus' phrase. You will show yourself to be an unbeliever, and you will lose all of the mercy and grace that were held out to you in Jesus Christ. And so these categories give us a tool or a lens to evaluate our lives and doctrine. Do you find that you are unstable? Are you weak and uneasily done? There's certainly a sense in which all of us are those things, given the the sin that so easily entangles us. But here Peter is operating from a view that sees stability as a real and achievable quality. Christian maturity is there for the taking. It's available to those who want it. It is not a pipe dream. And so that raises the question, how do we get there? How do we gain this stability, this strength, this maturity? And verse 18 answers it. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But is a word of contrast, right? It's a disjunction. Don't do this. 
Instead, do that. Don't be carried away into lawless instability. Instead, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So the way to stability is through Jesus. It's through trusting in him. Through repenting and turning away from any other path, any other savior or helper, any other hope. So much of the instability in our lives comes because we place our hopes in other saviors, in weak saviors, in imitation saviors. We, we look to people and things that, that may be well and good in and of themselves. They're not necessarily bad things. But they cannot bear the weight that only your creator and savior can bear. They cannot save you. And so if you think, well, if I could just get married, or if I could just have a child, or if I could just see that person elected, if I could just gain that job, if I could just accomplish that financial goal, if I could just whatever, then I'll be happy. You're wrong. You're wrong. There is no ultimate saving happiness to be found in those things. That is the path to instability. You're asking a creature to bear weight it cannot bear. It's not wrong to desire those things. Those can be very good things. But it is wrong to make them the source of your hope and joy. And inasmuch as you do, you're opening yourself up to false teachers and false teaching who will promise you salvation in the very area that you so desperately crave it even as they use and abuse you for their own selfish purposes. So part of what this passage is doing for us is orienting us to the transformative truth that true justice and lasting happiness and enduring peace are found in one and only one place, in the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And until we see him face to face, we will only experience any of those things in part at best. And we do. We experience them. That that, that age has broken into this age. Thank God. But we don't have the fullness yet. And we won't have the fullness yet until we see him face to face. And so that's why Peter ends this letter the way that he does. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Jesus Christ is the glorious one. He is glorious now. He is fully glorious now in ways that we don't fully appreciate because we don't see him face to face. He is the glorious one. And in the gospel, we behold and engage with his glory. Grace has broken into this world and into this age, but we have not seen it in its fullness yet. That blessing awaits judgment day or what he here terms the day of eternity. Right, the, the day that leads to eternity, the day that stands as the doorway to the eternal age, to the new heavens and the new earth. The day when all who have hoped in Jesus will be fully glorified and we will enter our eternal and blessed reward. I ask Doug and the ushers to come. And brothers, as you come, you can start to distribute the elements for the Lord's Supper, please. So Peter is saying to us, take care that you are not caught up in the false hopes and promises of lawless, unstable, ignorant deceivers. Instead, look to Christ. Grow in his grace by growing in your knowledge of him. Don't don't leave these as abstract truths that just hang out there. You have to take them and apply them to your own mind and heart. You have to take your sins to the cross and know and experience the forgiveness and grace and love of Jesus Christ. That is what strengthens and matures and stabilizes the Christian. And so Peter ends this letter right back where he began this letter. And so if we look at uh, 2 Peter 1-2... May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And then here in 318, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's their bookends from first to last. This is what he's telling us. The grace of God is being held, to, held out to all of us, even now, in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Won't you turn to him? Whether it's For the very first time as you take your sins, knowing that you deserve the wrath of God, that you've rebelled against God, that you have no way to be in the right with God apart from the mercy and grace that he extends to you. Or for the millionth time, 
where you struggled with a sin in the car on the way to church that you've struggled with 8,700 times before. And you take that to the Savior and you find he's not surprised. He's not undone. He has made provision for our sins according to his knowledge. He knows them perfectly. He died for them perfectly. The grace and mercy of Jesus Christ are held out to us. And so whether it's with our sins or in your suffering where you're carrying a sorrow that seems so overwhelming and so disorienting and so draining of all hope and you bring that to the Savior, And you know that life and purpose and hope and peace and comfort are in Him. Every moment of every day, we are to be diligent to be found by Him. To be diligent to turn to Him. With gratitude for His kindness, we turn to Him. And as we do, we know His grace and comfort and peace. We are strong and mature and stable in him so fight for stability by knowing Christ let's pray Father we are so grateful that you have not given us a program for self improvement you've not given us seven steps or four laws or three routines you you have held out to us a savior who did all that we need, who fulfilled your law perfectly, who accomplished everything that righteousness requires, who knows our sins fully and died, bearing the penalty that we deserve, that we earned, that we incurred. He died. He bore your wrath so that we can be forgiven and cleansed. We can come boldly before your throne of grace. We cannot be weak and immature and tossed around by the the trials of life. We can stand steadfast, not in ourselves, but in Jesus. Father, please help us to understand and embrace and apply and live in the good of these truths so that we can grow, so that we can be oaks of righteousness planted by the Lord so that we can be means of grace to uh, our families and friends, to our co-workers, to those that you bring into our lives so that we can point others to the unsurpassing greatness of our Savior, Jesus Christ, so that he receives the, the praise and the glory that he's due. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.